Hello, this is Expand Music with Noel Webb. I am Noel Webb, and just hearing that music being warbly explains, uh, it, it exemplifies how the Internet, the Internet radio that's now happening so much around the world, can be different than terrestrial, if you know the difference. So, you know, a little warbly little music there in the middle of it. So tonight we have a, a guest who is so important to Los Angeles, though she's so humble. I've already talked with her, uh, and uh, she works for Inaudible Productions, and I'm very, very happy to invite her here, Allison Litton. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. This she she I'll talk about you now, Allison. You know she came to L.A. thinking she wanted to be an A and R, uh, never even knowing what music supervisor is. She ends up with Peter Afterman at uh, Inaudible Productions. Immediately does shows for uh, Act of Valor. And uh, a number of Saturday Night Live, now Inaudible Productions uh, with Peter and, and uh, with, uh, um, with Margaret, Margaret Ann yeah. and uh, with you, Allison, represent the Rolling Stones, uh, Joe Walsh, um, uh, James Brown's estate, all sorts of other things. So I want to ask you some questions. We're going to get there in a second about your history, of course, and about... Uh, how music uh, supervision is applied to the different music we're going to play in a second, uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, first of all, you came from New Jersey. Well, I was born in New Jersey. Yeah. I moved nine times before I got to Los Angeles, so I moved out here in 1999. So I've been here 14 years, and I've been at Inaudible Productions for 12. So, so into being a music supervisor, how you got there, so you said you came here and, and thought you might be doing, doing A&R, uh, and you moved from a few companies. But how? So tell the audience, if you would, how it serendipitously, serendipitously fits into how you get to be a music supervisor. Um, well, I, you know, I wasn't, I'm not a musician, but I've always loved music. I've always been around musicians. And I had a boyfriend who um, was in a band, so I started doing sort of marketing promotions, booking for the band, and then we decided to move to Los Angeles, and um, and I thought, okay, well, what kind of career could I do? And I thought about A&R, and I really didn't know very much about it other than, you know, the idea was that I'd love to, you know, find bands, sign them, get their music out to the world. That was, like, my main, you know, dream. So it sort of... Um, happened in a different way through music supervision but i you know i i didn't really know what that job was i i worked for a software company when i first moved out here and yeah. there was uh -huh. a friend of mine that worked at electra and she heard of um this company called soundtrack site um that dominic griffin and peter afterman had started and dominic was looking for someone to work with him and so she suggested I, you know, call them up, and they were looking for someone to start immediately. I went in and interviewed, and I got called back in that same day, and I basically got the job on the spot, and it turned out it was a company that was combined with Inaudible. It was sort of like the sister company, and um, we we represented, you know, catalogs for placement. So I sort of learned the business through the selling side of music, you know, like licensing, um, negotiating fees and things like that. But you're you're also, when you're pitching music, you're learning music supervision as well because you have to think of music for a scene. And, you know, like would your catalog, when, would any of your songs in your catalog work for that scene when someone's, you know, when a music supervisor is coming to you um, to find out if you have any songs that would work, you have to kind of go through and, mentally and um mentally think about the the scene but then also listen to the music and see if it would work so i kind of learned music supervision that way and then eventually we started you know Dominic and i did some music supervision and music clearance work and then eventually um we we sort of disbanded he went to go work for one of our clients because we were hired by labels to pitch their catalog and we also had publishing of billy joel and bob dylan at the time and um this was in 2001 to about 2004 or 5 and so dominic went to go work for our client which at the time was hollywood records and now he's over at disney disney music and um he's still there and i um i ended up 
sort of moving over full time to inaudible productions, and that's how I learned the music supervision, the buying, I guess, is the side of things, and you know, finding music for films. And I um, I did an ABC television show called October Road, so I I did some TV, and um, then in 2009 um, we picked up the Rolling Stones catalog for pitching so i'm kind of doing all of it again <laughs> all of it again well you know actually yeah. you 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 mentioned uh that you think th- that uh you put yourself in the mind of the people the editors who are music supervisors who are uh laying the tracks in syncing them as someone yourself who's selling your catalog mm-hmm. and i keep mm-hmm. recommending to people in all walks of life that you need to you should uh put yourself in the place of the person you're either selling to or whatever it is, you know, for myself and and for you then, uh, you know, what does an editor really want when you're trying to sell your catalog? Um, uh, Rather than, you know, I want to sell my catalog. I got this stuff. I want to sell me to this, uh, to this, whatever it is you're doing, you know, really think about what the person needs who you're, you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And that's what you were talking about. Right. And you have to be okay with, oh, you know what? I don't have a song that's going to work for the scene. I'm not going to just pitch some song, you know, because I feel like that's sort of wasting a person's time to have to listen to things that really don't work or don't fit, and it's just, you know, it's you'll get them next time. So it's it's great to sort of have a, you know, the person in mind and the scene in mind, and, and if your catalog isn't going to work for this scene, there will be another one that comes by that you can pitch for. Yeah, you know, and, and of course you're, you lose your credibility uh, and right. you're wasting time. <laughs> And uh, you're both on the same purpose, you know, to, to service that film honestly. Uh, I know mm-hmm. the, the catalog and the music library wants to make money, of course, but the purpose is to service that film, and that's the action. So it is interesting to know that the larger companies uh, uh, have people pitching for, you know, the Disney catalog, uh, do m- major uh, acts like the Stones, well, you're representing them now, uh, do major acts pitch uh, music supervisors and films for their music, you know, the major acts pitching as well? Um, well, I, I guess through someone like me that might be uh-huh. representing the catalog, um, you know, I mean, I do mean, like, do they actually pitch to a director themselves? Or, yeah, well, I mean, does, that does might the representative... Be... Yeah? Oh, go ahead. Does the, does the rep of, uh, of Styx or uh, Kansas, you know, whatever, uh, do they go out and, and try and sell their music readily to all the, the film Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, sometimes there's managers that, you know, have their own sort of pitching team. I think, you know, back when I started in, in you know, 2001, I think that they were more readily outsourcing to to people to work their baby bands, you know, major labels were, and... And maybe they didn't have a, a full-on film and television department at the time that was focused on doing this. And I think the industry's changed in the last 12 years, and I do think the major labels have an entire marketing team, and you know they have um, pitching people, and they have licensing people that are dedicated to working catalogs. Um, but for someone like the Rolling Stones, they own their own masters, so they're not really with a label. Um, so, you know, and they really weren't really just openly marketing and, and licensing their music, and now now we've been hired to do that. So I'm, you know, I'm, you know obviously cautiously, we're very, we're very cautious about what we license, but, you know, they're definitely more open to having their music out there. Well, as a music supervisor, then I know you wear two hats here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you must just get bombarded. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm a, have a music library, you know, and I've already bombarded you a little bit already. So you must get bombarded with so much music coming at you. Yes, I do. And <laughs> yes, you know, I do. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I try very hard to um, respond to most people that email me, and if I don't, I save every single email that comes in um, because there's always. You know, when I'm looking for music as a music supervisor, I go back to that folder and I sort of do a search and, you know, I have my sort of trusted people that I already know, but I'm, I'm willing to meet people and, and, and listen to their catalogs and things like that, but I don't 
have time to listen to every single email that comes in, mm -hmm. um, sure. to be honest. And, and But I do keep their emails for future reference. So Well, you are so nice uh, coming, coming back to me uh, when I first uh, said hello to you. This is very nice. Thank you. And I have to say something else about Allison, folks, when you're listening here, that uh, some people get where they get because they're so specific detailed and she's and just as an interviewer i'm here interviewing here now and for the last couple of weeks she's been on to some specifics uh of what uh i needed what i needed uh and uh that's you know that's why people get where they get so you know you got to work hard and uh, be detailed and progressive and all that so thank you Alessa, for doing that well thank you thank you <laughs> well, well sure absolutely so um uh, the, you know, it is interesting that I, I know lots of music supervisors, and there aren't that many women. Uh, and uh, it is funny, because I'm going to say a sexist thing here. Women seem to have a wider breadth of knowing a lot of bands. I'm not sure why. I, I just seem to find that. I, I don't know why. You know, a wider set of of knowing a lot of styles. Is that crazy to say, or what's that about? I don't know. I, I really, I don't know if it's a male-female thing. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Any, any, yeah, uh, any I thoughts? Can't, I cannot women? honestly speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, for me, it's like, I, I think, I don't know. I think for me, it's like, I like music, so I try to, try to listen to all types, and, you know, as much as I can. I mean, I feel, I will say that I do, <laughs> sometimes feel overwhelmed with the amount of music that's out there these days mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know and i try to keep up with with the new artists and and all of that but yeah it gets a little overwhelming i know um <laughs> but does do you have do you know, is, do you it, listen, is it a male versus female do, yeah do i listen to music yeah purely yes. just to sit back oh, purely. And, you know yeah <laughs> yeah i do i do yeah i mean you know like Honestly, like my weekend enjoyable, what I put on kind of uh, band is usually Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> like I'll uh -huh. just listen to that. It puts me in a good mood, um, you know. And then sometimes I'll just listen. Like when I'm on the, when I'm in the car, I love KCRW, you know. And maybe that's cliche, but I love that station. I think that they play such great new artists and eclectic music. So it's always fun to listen to that. Um, but I also listen to it. Um, amp amp <laughs> radio. So I oh, listen yeah. to a lot of like pop, dance, sort of you know urban sort of music too. Mm -hmm. Was there some music? I know you were looking to A and R and and came into being a music supervisor uh, in a different way. Was there some some film or film trailer that kicked all this off for you that you got excited about, or a tune that you heard in a film that wrapped it all together? Um, no, I mean, I really didn't know about the whole music, you know, the job of music supervision, but I, I do think that, like, in the late 90s, like, 96, for me, I was, I was exposed to a lot of cool indie films, and, I mean, Trainspotting, I guess, is, at this point, very popular, but, you know, back then, to me, it was just great, and the music was amazing, and, you know, there's, like, doom generation and things like that so it was back then i think it was more like a electronica sort of thing that was going on in soundtracks which i found pretty interesting and you know i mean i think um it, it was really happenstance i didn't even know what this job was but when i figured it out i was like this is a really cool job <laughs> you know oh, you felt um, very good huh yeah right very nice yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it is it is funny that constantly people are getting bored and that uh, with the music they're getting, although, you know, older tunes are always great to play, of course, uh, and mm -hmm. stuff that we remember. But, you know, everybody wants a new sound always. And I can appreciate that uh, as you, you know, for either a, a, a film or for a trailer anyway. Right. Uh, so your first one of your first. Well, I don't know if you first or not, but you did Act of Valor. Right. And that definitely wasn't one of my first but it was um a really cool film to work on it was because it was the all the actors were actual navy seals so you know and then the directors were stuntmen so it was a really action packed kind of film and it was mostly score so we worked with Nathan first and then um we 
had to find a couple source cues um, because it was taking place in, I think, South America or something. And, um, you know, so you wanted something authentic to the region. Um, But, yeah, so that was a big one that we worked on. it's so one best original song, so the music right. supervisor has to take credit for you know well, finding the best nominated. original song. Yeah, it was yeah. it was nominated. Um, well, nominated, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So Keith Urban was one of the writers, and you know it was it was kind of like a idea that that came about through the um, the soundtrack company that was putting it out. And forgive me for not remembering. And um, you know, just all of us kind of coming up with an idea and and. Scott Waugh, the uh, director, kind of met with Keith, and and he wrote a song. So, yeah. so you're also uh, you have done clearance also. So you know, music clearance right. is different. People, I'm talking to the folks here, mm-hmm. different than music supervisors searching and and ha- and we're gonna we're gonna actually gonna gonna play some stuff from from a uh, uh, a film. Uh, that uh, she was quite involved with Frankie Go Boom, and how maybe if we can get specific, specific about it, uh, which and here's, the, here's the read for that. A comedy about two brothers, a girl with a broken heart, a sex tape, an angel, and a pig. <laughs> Frankie Go Boom. So that's, of course, what you have to go off of when you're beginning, uh, and uh, the tactics are real. So, um, so Frankie right, Go Boom. Right, and so when you're getting your music clearance, you have to explain what this film is about and yeah. explain it, you know. Right. So budget's a big deal for you. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, this was a <laughs> yeah, this was a really fun film. I mean, you know, it it had a huge cast. It's it's by um well, it was written and directed by Jordan Roberts and and right. it's really inspired by his relationship with his own siblings. Um and it's just about two brothers, essentially an older brother, a younger brother, the older brother's Bruce, the younger brother's Frankie, and he just kind of tortures his younger brother throughout his whole entire life and is constantly trying to aspire to be a director, so he uses Frankie as his, you know, <laughs> victim. And he films him, and he films a wedding that Frankie is about, well, his own wedding, and then it turns out that his uh, soon-to-be bride is cheating on him, so he sort of has a meltdown, you know, and, and his older brother's taping this whole thing, and it goes viral, and so it's very embarrassing, and then it leads to another embarrassing tape, which turns out to be sort of a sex tape, where it really isn't a sex tape because he never has sex, but it's it's more embarrassing because he doesn't he he doesn't have sex, but you know it's it's released to the internet, and the girl that is his love interest doesn't know about it, and he's trying to hide it the whole time, and so Frankie's older brother is trying to hide it from the the this man that turns out to be Frankie's love interest father. So there's a lot of complicated plot lines, but it's very funny. And, you know, it's it's Charlie Hunnam from Sons of Anarchy, and Ron Perlman plays an ex-con who's um, transgender. So it's really, it's a, a he, he plays a she, so, you know, his character's name is Phyllis, and... Then there's uh, Lizzie Kaplan, and she's the love interest, and Chris O'Dowd is the brother, of Bruce. So, um, you know, I I basically put together some songs to play for you, which would show kind of like, um, well, the humor of it, first of all, how you can use music for humor, because... Oh, that's great. Uh, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah so we're going to talk about that. But you know, it's funny uh, that, she, that Allison, you just got so specific about this, and I was just doing a, uh, I just voiced a trailer, voiceover work, and the mm-hmm. director went on and on with me about telling the specifics of the, the film, while I'm just doing like three lines, doing a voice, voice you know, voicing the trailer. And mm-hmm. this is what people do. Guys, you know that you get the more specific you get about knowing something. So Allison's applying music, and she's telling she, she's own, so into the specifics of exactly what happens in the film, and that's what you do. You know, you get that right. detail about because it helps you, gives you fodder, gives you stuff to work with, right? You know, so exactly. this is Frankie, and, Frankie and Phyllis's dance. Uh, from Frankie Go Boom, which uh, uh, Inaudible Productions worked on. Allison Littmore here with her. Uh, I'm not even going to give you the number right now because we just have so much to talk about. So here is Frankie and Phyllis Dance. Phyllis? It's me again. When 
That's great, man. I mean, it's exactly what you just said. The humor of the music you applied uh, uh, to the to the scene. Right, because Phyllis is transgender, so <laughs> it's sort of like it is. It's one of those moments where it's totally on point lyrically, but it's funny because you know the the scene is really awkward because Frankie has to go and ask Phyllis for help and. Phyllis is sort of coming on to him while they're slow dancing, and you know it's just mm-hmm. it's awkward and funny. And and Ron Perlman is probably the ugliest woman you'll ever see, you know, because he's just <laughs> okay. really an unattractive, you know, lady. Um, so it's just funny, you know. And the music, I think, helped make it even I, funnier. It sounded like it did. You know, it is it is funny because the different people who come on the show think that the audio version, Allison, you know, isn't going to really be entertaining and it really is. You can see this stuff, uh, mm-hmm. you know, see the visual just by your imagination. So, sometimes you have to replace songs, uh, right. finding replacement for songs. What What's that about? Well, you, um, you know, in overall, in general, what we do is we sort of temp in the, the music. And so you temp in sort of a score and you temp in sort of the source music or or songs that you want to play over a scene. So we we had an idea for some of the music that would play over this particular scene where um Frankie and Lassie um get into a big fight. It's sort of like a moment where it could just ruin everything and so Frankie um you know he goes back to his retreat in the desert because he spends a lot of time away from his family. He tries to hide in the desert. And so now that they're, they've just gotten into a big fight, he goes back to the desert. And, you know, you're going to hear a cell phone ringing, <laughs> a lot of cell phone. And it's just really a montage scene where he's just spending time out in the desert, you know, and, and part of him doesn't want to answer the phone and part of him then realizes, oh, well, maybe she's calling And so um, we tempt in Christina Perry, um, the song Arms, and it didn't work for various reasons. Mostly, you know, it it, it just doesn't. When you watch it, it doesn't work as well as the replacement song that we'll play as well. So I'm going to play in a second, but Mm -hmm. when you replace songs, sometimes you have to, as a music supervisor with a budget, you have to replace a song that's expensive with something less expensive. Is that part of what Mm -hmm. you're talking about, of course? Yeah, exactly. And right. Uh, with on that subject, do you uh, less famous artists, uh, rock or hip hop or folk or whatever? Um, how are you before we even get to this? How are you looking for the less famous artists? Well, there's various ways that I look. Um, you know, I I'll listen to music. I'll go on you know Spotify or iTunes or whatever, and I'll just go through and I'll find artists that are similar. But I also, I mean. I am not ashamed to say that I reach out to my my contacts and I and I say look I'm looking for you know this type of music I describe the scene and I say you know I'm looking for a song that might work so I end up getting some pitches you know and uh so I go through all those songs and sort of weed out and find ideas from that and so this is kind of how I got the replacement song I went to um Secret Road and and they had an artist that is amazing, and I love—I still love the song. So um, 
that's how we ended up replacing this. this mm. So Frankie and uh, so this is Frankie O'Boom, uh, Inaudible Productions, Allison Litton, and this is uh, another scene uh, for showing some song replacement. Mm-hmm. What an With awesome thing! We decided to go dark in the end, bro. Mom, stop fucking calling. It's not your mother. Unfortunately, I can't bear children. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Intriguing, Allison. So I thought the the phone calls, even though you told me in the front end it was going to happen, that it was, you know, your your guy calling or whatever, and you're back on, but it's... <laughs> It's the, it's the music. It's the trailer. Right. It's the uh, scene. It's it's the scene, right? The scene is you know he's hiding in the desert and and his cell phone keeps ringing and you know it, it's just him trying to sort of hide from his family and that's why he gets angry when he picks up the phone. He thinks it's his mother, but instead it's Phyllis who can't bear children. Oh, so. what <laughs> and a then, wonderful song, Allison. That's a nice right? song. Right. Well, that one's great but we had we ended up having to replace it and i think that the replacement is just as good oh. or oh do i have actually replacement here? almost mm-hmm, i think so it's the amy stroop um, oh fantastic let me play it right yeah. away then here's the okay. re- so that's yeah, the so tune the replacement. christina perry that they that was a great tune too so here's what uh, what allison replaced it with that's good here it comes here it is lassie leave me alone lassie but it, it looked that realistic. Hold on to hope, love. I search high and low for you. For you. calling. It's not your mother. Unfortunately, I can't bear children. <laughs> oh, boy. Allison, wonderful job. Uh, we're actually a few seconds out of time, and it was a lot of fun with you. Allison Litton from Inaudible Productions. Time flew by, Allison. Yes, it did. <laughs> it really did. Really Thanks did. Thanks so much for having me. It was It was a lot of fun. Oh, well, everybody got a lot of information, which is really important, and some smiles, and so... Allison, thank you very much. Uh, This is Expand Music with Noel Webb. I'll see you next Wednesday. Uh, Take care. Thank you again, Allison. Bye-bye.
It's gonna be made, so we listen, we watch the news, the tunes, the gaga, the report, the seaport, the speed song, clothes she wears. What clues can we shuffle through to keep from drowning too much, man? I can tell that you really need to grow, you really need to grow. I can tell that you really Nothing's gonna be new to you, but soon from behind on the latest lawsuit to cover all bases. Cause the New York Yankees make me, sank me. Coldplay tells me what to do. I'm thinking for yourself. But if they don't, they won't, they don't, they won't, they can't. You can't see where you're standing in the crowd, but you really can't see where you're walking in the world, baby. Walk, man, walk. And see where you run by yourself, yourself. You can't see where you're standing in the crowd, but you really can't see where you're walking in the world, baby. 